Amen. So, hey, what we do here at Crossroads Church is we just go through the Bible, right? And so this isn't going to be a Mother's Day themed sermon. I don't have the three M's for mom or the ABCs or anything like that. It's just going to be what's next up in the scriptures. And so uh, you can turn in your Bibles if you want to to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to begin chapter 4 today up to this point in scripture, uh, what has been happening is Paul has been writing the church in Corinth. It's a church that he started. He founded the church. He ministered there. He pastored them. And then he left it in capable hands and he went to start other churches. And so right now when he's writing this letter, he's in Ephesus, starting a church in Ephesus. He's writing back to the church in Corinth because there were some people from Corinth that traveled to see him in Ephesus and said, bro, we got some problems. And so they just told him about all the stuff that was happening and all the things that were going wrong. And Paul decides, I'm going to write a letter and I'm going to set some things in order. And so this is uh, equal parts chastisement for what they're doing wrong and encouragement and how to get it right. And so that's what we see throughout the entire letter of Corinthians, actually first and second. It's, hey, this is not going well. Do this instead. And so the first topic that he, that he talks about is, uh, is the fact that they were spending time in service arguing about which preachers they should follow. He didn't think that they should be doing that. In fact, he really encourages Christians to not be people who argue, period. And so one of the things that he does is he tries to draw their attention away from the arguments, away from the the preferences of personality, and and he draws them towards certain things. And so this is what he does. So he, he, first of all, he points them towards unity. He encourages them towards unity. And unity is actually the lens through which we should view all the rest of the entire book of 1 Corinthians. Everything that he talks about in 1 Corinthians, he's talking to them about unity. And so this is the first thing he does. He says, stop arguing about your preferences. Be unified. And so then uh, he points them towards purpose. He starts off by I'm talking about the preachers. They've got different styles. They've got different reasons that that people would prefer them. And he says, listen, we're all just doing our purpose. My job was to plant other people water. It's God that gives the increase. So instead of focusing on on the people, focus on the purpose. And then what we're going to see today is he's sort of, uh, before he transitions into the next topic, is what he does is he points them toward judgment and reward. Now that doesn't sound like a very fun Mother's Day sermon. That's just kind of where we are in the passage of Scripture. And so stand with me if you would. We're going to read 1 Corinthians 4. We're going to read the first five verses together. And um, we're going to kind of let it play off of Ephesians chapter 2 a little bit. And we're kind of going to, uh, we're going to kind of go back, not kind of, we are going back and forth between the two. I'm going to read this along with you. Read it with me. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. You may be seated. So what Paul has been doing in the first three chapters of 1 Corinthians is uh, on repeat, reminding them of the gospel. So why do we have unity? Because of the gospel. Why do we focus on purpose? Because of the gospel. Why should we not be arguing? Because of the gospel. Why is it more important for us to do other things as opposed to whatever we prefer? Because of the gospel. So this is the thing that he keeps circling back around to is the gospel, the message of the cross. And so then we get here to the first five verses of chapter four, and then he, it's, it's almost like this switch in tone. So he goes from the gospel to accountability, judgment, and reward. And this seems like it sort of goes against what we've been taught about the gospel. 
we've been taught that the gospel is free, that the message of the cross is free, that salvation is free. In fact, it numerous times throughout scripture, it's called the gift of of God. We see that in Romans 6:23. It is the gift or the gift of God is eternal life. Salvation is free. Well, we've been taught that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we see this in Ephesians 2, verse 8. It's by grace you've been saved through faith, not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. We've been taught that we are not saved by works. In fact, if you keep reading in Ephesians chapter 2, it says not by works, very clear, so that no one can boast. So we've been taught that, that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ, and that we are not saved by our works. And then right here, Paul is, is targeting topics that all center around what the Bible calls works, that there's accountability for your actions, that there will be judgment based on your actions, that there will be a reward based on your actions. And so he's talking to them about the message of the cross, the message of the cross, the message of the cross, salvation, 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 and then he shifts gears and starts talking to them about their works. And I say shift gears because the other verses that we read, Romans and Ephesians, were also written by Paul. He's the same guy that did this. He says both things. And so uh, what a lot of people can get confused when they start reading about works in the Bible because the Bible does talk about what we do and how we live as Christ followers. And they can start to put a lot of weight in that, uh, in that basket. In fact, there are entire denominations that are built solely on your works. If you don't dress a certain way, if you don't look a certain way, if you don't do a certain thing at a certain time, if you don't do the certain thing at a certain time, believing or saying the certain thing, like it's not, it's not good enough that you did it, you have to do it our way, like they're very weighted into works, and, and that's because the Bible talks about works. But what I think is that Paul is not, he's not presenting two topics that sort of contradict which is how a lot of people present them. It's either saved freely or saved by what you do. He's not, he's not presenting these two things that contradict. He's presenting these two things that complement. But they are very different. So there's, there's one that the Bible talks about, which is you're saved and it's free. And there's another that the Bible talks about is you're saved and you do works. And what happens is these two things form this tension in the Bible. And this tension, there's a lot of, of ways that the Bible does this, where it creates this tension, one thing against the other thing. And it wants us to live inside that tension where we know that it's a little of this, it's a little of this. And, and today what we're going to do is we're going to explain how can it be both and on a subject that seems like it should be either or. Tracking with me? In verse 2, he says, It is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Now, this is a, a very, uh, it's kind of even a harsh tone. It's required that you must. It's not required that you give an effort. It's not re required that you try. It's not required that you just, you know, that old college try. That's not what, it's required that you must prove faithful. And there's this air about this that you will stand in front of the throne of God himself and give an account for the things that you've done or the things that you didn't do that you were supposed to do. And what the Bible is telling us is it, is requi it will be required of you that you must prove faithful. This is a lot harsher than, hey, we're saved by grace through faith and everything's fine. And again, there's this tension so here's the first part of the tension. The first part of the tension is we are justified by faith. We're justified by faith. So if you're taking notes, that's point one. We are justified by faith. Now, now justified, that's a $5 church word. It just means made righteous. It's all that it means. Made righteous. See, God is holy. God is perfect. God is just. God is everything good. And the fact of the matter is we are not that. I mean, I can say that about me, maybe not you. I'm not perfect. I mean, you might be. I have sinned. You might not have ever. 
I mean, we, we're just not that. When you look at the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the perfection of God, the trueness of God, that it's not, those descriptors don't describe us. And so what happens is, is we are justified, we're made righteous, so God makes us righteous so that we can be righteous because we're not. When you look at the world religions and just human logic, there's only two ways that you can be made righteous. According to other world religions, the, the first way is you earn it. You've got to do something. There's, a, there's work that you have to do, and the more work you do, the more righteous you are. And if you do it the right way, then you'll be counted as righteous. And so you, you try, and you work, and you, and you, you hope, and, and you pray that, that you've done enough so that when you stand in front of God, he says, man, your heart is really wicked. You know, you didn't forgive those people from junior high when they wouldn't let you sit by them on the bus. And, um, but, dadgummit, you've done so much good, I just, my hands are tied. Come on in. But that's not how it works. But every other world religion would have you believe that you can earn your way into favor with God or with the gods, depending on the religion. That's every other world religion. One of the things that differentiates Christianity from all the other world religions is, is, is the second option. So the first option in how we're made righteous is we earn it. We do enough, we're able to work hard enough to do enough good that we become righteous. The, the second option is that God just makes us righteous because it's his deal. And this is what the Bible tells us. The Bible actually tells us that you cannot earn righteousness. This is why we have grace. Grace means unearned favor. When you start to think you earn it, it's no longer grace. That's not how it works. God gives us grace. It is by grace that we're saved because of the grace of God. He just looks at us and says, wow, y'all are not righteous. Out of my grace, I will make you righteous. And he just does it. And there's nothing that we did to earn it. Because we can't earn it. He just makes it happen. This is why Paul can say in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. I know I referenced it earlier. I want us to read it together. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. This is one of the, ma the passages of Scripture that I reference frequently. We've talked a lot about this. The gift of God that it talks about in verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. The gift of God uh, grammatically actually refers back to faith, not grace. So the grace is not the gift of God. The gift of God is the faith. Now, this is called by theologians saving faith. So it's different from faith to do miracles. There's a difference in those kinds of faith. This is just the faith to believe that Jesus is the Savior and that he can and will save you. And so what Paul is saying here is, out of his grace, he looks at us and he says, wow, y'all are not righteous. I'm going to make you righteous. And the first step in making us righteous is that he gifts us faith. Because we, didn't, we can't even muster up enough faith. That's how unrighteous we are. We can't even muster up enough faith to believe that he is God and that he would save us. And so he gives us that faith. And the Bible tells us why, so that we can't boast. Otherwise, what would happen is we would look at each other and we would say, you know, you were saved uh, from Sunday school. Didn't take a lot of faith for you. I was saved in a bar. Takes a lot of faith for me. I've got more faith than you. I, my faith is better than your faith. And we start this natural compare and contrast against each other. And Paul's removing that from us. And what he's doing is he's saying, it doesn't matter if you were saved in Sunday school or if you were saved in a bar. None of that matters. What matters is that God saw you in your sin, that he chose to make you righteous out of his grace, and that with his grace, he gave you a gift of saving faith so that you could be saved. And that's how it works. So we're made righteous. We're justified through faith. And that faith is his faith that he gave us. 
that we did nothing for. Here's where we see the tension in the two truths. If we keep reading in Ephesians, what we see is, is actually in the very next verse, we see what we see in 1 Corinthians. So here's the second thing that we're going to be looking at. Not only are we justified by faith, we're judged by works. So we're justified by faith, but we're judged by works. Let's read Ephesians 2, 8 again, but we're going to go all the way through verse 10, and we're going to see the two as they play against each other here. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This provides the context by which we can best understand 1 Corinthians chapter 4. That yes, we are justified by faith, that there's this gift of God, that's how we're justified, but we're also judged by the works that we do or don't do. So here's the, the key statement to understanding 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Our works don't save us. We work because we're saved. This is how these two things add up. This is how they work together. We're not, we're not saved by our works. We're saved and then we work. We, we're saved and then we, we work because we're saved. And so, so that's how it works. Now, if you are not saved and you're trying to do the work of the Lord, you're probably not going to do that well. We're saved and then we work. And the Bible tells us here that he actually has prepared those works for us in advance. So he saves us out of his grace by giving us faith. We're justified by faith. And then he gives us works to do. And then he holds us accountable to whether or not we did the works that he's asking us to do. And this is a part of the salvation process is that we are saved, he gives us something to do, and then we are held accountable. There's accountability, there is judgment, and there is reward for the things that we do for his kingdom. So as we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I want us just to walk through these five verses, and uh, we're just going to make some notes of some things with this as our backdrop. Justified by faith, judged by works. Here's what he says in verse 1. He says, this then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ, and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now, uh, he says we're entrusted with the mysteries of God. That's what he is. Now, he's speaking uh, in direct reference to, again, the preference of preachers. So there were some in Corinth that were saying we should follow Paul. There were others saying, no, we should follow Apollos. He's another minister that was there. Some were saying, well, we went to Jerusalem and we listened to, to Peter, and so we, we should follow him. They called him Cephas at that time. We should follow this guy. And some are like, oh, all y'all are wrong. We need to just follow Jesus. What did Jesus say? And so there's this argument that's taking place, and that's how they were spending their corporate time in worship together. They would come together and argue about the different preachers and who they should follow. And, and Paul's saying, listen, here's how you should regard all of us. But he knows that what he's doing is he's setting an example for how we, as image bearers of Christ, as followers of Christ, how we should be engaging our world around us and the attitudes and thoughts that we should have about ourselves as well. And so he's not just saying, listen, as an apostle... As one of those about whom you are arguing, this is how you should do this. He's giving us an example for when you are being the ones who share the love of Jesus with people, when you are doing the works that God has called you to do, here's how your heart should be. Here are the things that you should think. Here are the, the, the attitudes that you should have. And so he's setting that example. What he says is we are entrusted with the mysteries of God. The mysteries of God, this is a different way for him to reference what he's been talking about for the entire three chapters previous to this, which is the message of the cross. This is the gospel. The gospel is that we are justified by faith. That's the gospel. That God in his mercy, which is rich, looked down from heaven and chose to save us and that we can be saved. Why? Because of the work of Jesus on the cross. And so he says, this is the mystery that we have. 
He says, you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries that God has revealed. This is how we should regard ourselves. It's not just how we should regard Paul. This is how we as Christ followers should regard ourselves, that we are servants of Christ and that we've been entrusted with the mysteries. Entrusted with, in the Greek, is a phrase that means one who manages a house and is accountable to the owner. So when he says we're entrusted with this, what he's saying is this is not our mystery. It's God's mystery. And we're accountable to him because he trusted us with this. He gave us this entrustment. He entrusted us with this knowledge, this gift that we have, and now we're accountable to him because it's his. And then he continues that through logical thought progression in verse 2. He says, now it is required that those who have been given a trust must Prove faithful. So, so we see consistency in verses 1 and 2 where he's saying God has given us the message of the cross. He has trusted us with this. And because God has chosen to trust us with this, we need to prove faithful. So he's talking about our actions and the way that we live, the way that we, um, the way that we do the things that we do. And again, it's just a logical thought progression. We've been given a trust and we must prove faithful. Now, how do we prove faithful? Well, I mean, it tells us in Ephesians that God has created in advance things for us to do. It's going to look different for you than it might someone else, but God has given you opportunities for you to live the gospel. Maybe it's, it's Mother's Day. Maybe it's the way that you're raising your children. Maybe it's if your kids are grown, when they call you for advice, it's the way that you speak to them. Maybe it's the, the way, if you're not a mom, if you're all of us, maybe it's the way that we interact with the people around us, the way that you interact with the people at work, the, the way you interact with your neighbors, the, the way you interact with people at Walmart, the, the way that you interact with different people. As they interact with you, they should note a difference because God has given you opportunities to live the gospel. Maybe it's the friends that you have when they call you and say, hey, I'm really struggling with this, or, or, or you're just living life together, and you notice, wow, you're really angry today. What's going on? God has given you an opportunity to live the gospel. Maybe it's the type of job that you have where people naturally come to you and talk to you about things. God has given you an opportunity to live the gospel. So there's this, this air of accountability that should weigh on us as we just live our normal lives. So when Paul's talking about this, he's not talking about, y'all need to be teaching Sunday school. It's not what he's talking. He's talking about your normal life and the things that you do on a daily basis that you live the gospel in just a daily basis. This is what he's talking about. Because it would be easier for us to say, oh, you know what, that, that, probably, that probably applies to those people who work in kids' church over there. This is one of those verses, that's a Pastor Brock verse right there. No, this isn't professional Christians, it's all Christians. And he's saying how you live your life, it should reflect the nature of your relationship with Jesus, and you'll be held accountable for that. You must prove faithful that when he gifts you opportunities to do what he wants you to do, you take advantage of those and you do what he wants you to do. And then he kind of knows our hearts in this. And so he gives us some additional warning in verses 3 and 4. And he's using the hearts of the Corinthian church to actually uh, give us a backdrop for this and to be able to speak into something. But, but this is the part of the anointing of the Holy Spirit when Paul was writing this, which is the Bible. So he's writing this yes to the church in Corinth, but because it's Holy Spirit-inspired word of God, he's writing it to all of us. So, so God's using this opportunity to say, to speak to the church in Corinth, but to also speak to us all. This is what he says in verses three and four. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. Boy, that'd be a free life, wouldn't it? That's not where we live. I mean, just, just honest question. How many times did you look in a mirror before you left your house today? We don't live, our world is not a judgment-free zone. It's not where we live, right? We are our own worst critics. We, don't, we can't stand up here and be like, I don't even judge myself, I don't care. Whatever. Half my shirt's untucked, fine. 
I guess this is not how it works. But this is what Paul's saying. He's, he's speaking into our hearts and he's using this example as an opportunity. He's saying, I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. But, but then just to make sure that we don't hear that and say, oh, Paul thinks he's perfect. This is what he says in verse four. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It's the Lord who judges me. Now, again, Paul knows that he's setting us an example. This is the same guy who wrote in a different passage, follow me as I follow Christ. So he knows that he's setting us an example by, by what he's doing. And so he does it in a particular way. And what he's saying here ties back to the argument that the church was having about which preachers they should follow. He knew that if someone wanted to follow him, it's because they had made a judgment that he was better than someone else. And he knew if there were people there and there were groups there, literally groups that would say, we don't follow Paul, Apollos is here now, we follow Apollos now. And he knew that those groups had made judgment that Apollos was better than Paul. And there were still groups, the world travelers, that, that decided, no, Cephas is better than both of them. And there were the, the holy of holies that were walking around saying, but Jesus is the answer to everything. Which is true. I've got the youth group successfully trained. Whenever you ask them any question, their first answers are Jesus, the Bible. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter what you say. That's their answers, and I love it because, I mean, they're not wrong, right? So he's setting this example for us. He knew that they had been making judgments, passing judgments, and he knew that he was in that group that's being judged and so what he's saying to them is like, listen, I don't care that if you judge me. I, I'm speaking this to everybody. I don't care if you think I'm the guy you should follow. I don't, I don't care if you think you should follow someone else. Like, I, I'm, I, your judgment means nothing to me. I don't even judge myself. What he's doing is he's saying, listen, here is the thing that God wants me to do. Start that church. I started the church. And now here's what God wants me to do. Write you a letter saying, y'all, quit it. So I'm writing you a letter saying, y'all, quit it. And if you want to read this letter and someone wants to stand up and say, but Apollos didn't tell us to quit it, I don't care. I'm just doing what God told me to do. Y'all can do with it whatever you want. This should be our heart. Again, he's an example for us in how our hearts and our attitudes should be as we live out the gospel. We should truly be able to say, listen, I need to share something with you right now, and I don't care how you feel about it. It's not going to hurt my feelings if you don't like me anymore. Jesus loves you. He wants to forgive you. You need his grace right now. Sometimes there's accountability in that, right, where we hear someone talking and we're like, hey, how's your heart in that? I hate it when my wife asks me that. <laughs> because invariably it's like, well, it's ugly. It's sinful and wicked. You can clearly see that based on my tone of voice. Like, <laughs> I thought we were on the same page here. My heart's ugly right now, right? But that's the accountability that is written into Scripture that we can say, hey, how's, how's your heart in this right now? And, and not worry if it, well, how's your heart? No, 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 listen. Not, not about being judged right now, and I'm not passing judgment. God's given us something to do. Let's just make sure that we're doing it. He says, I don't care what you think about me. I'm just going to do what God entrusted me to do. I, I don't care if you judge me for it. I don't care if you judge me well. I don't care if you're, my, if you're for me. I don't care if you're against me. None of that matters. What matters is I'm going to do what God has asked me to do. And then he takes it a step further by saying, I don't even judge myself. I'm just going to do it. And this is hard for us. This is hard for us. And, and the more you do for God, what you'll find is the more critical you become of what you do for God. I mean, it's like anything, right? Listen, we have, uh, we have a door that is broken in our church. And, um, I mean, we don't have a locksmith in Paul's Valley. And I can't find a locksmith that's willing to say, yeah, for that one little job, I'll drive all the way to your town to do that one job. 
I'm on a list, and as soon as he has four or five or six or eight jobs over in this way, he might call. I mean, that's better than all the rest of them just said, no, I'm not doing that. So what happens? I've become pretty efficient at taking the door apart. Because you can't open it unless you take the door apart. And then once it's open, you can't put it back unless you take the door apart again. And I've gotten really good about it. I can take this door apart and I can open it. I can take the door apart and I can put it all back. It doesn't take me very, very long at all. But today, I had a realization. I've been living a lie. Why even put the door back together? I'm just going to take it apart again, right? So until the locksmith comes, we have a door that does not have a handle. It's just open. And here's what happened. This happened to me today, like this morning. I'm like, what? Why would I do that? Leave the handle off. And my immediate response to that revelation, which is God's goodness to me, right, that I didn't have to do that, my immediate response to myself was, I'm such an idiot. How did I not think of this the first time? And this, like, I know I'm not alone in this. We're our own critics. The more you do something, we just assume the better at it we should be because we've been doing it now for a long time. And, and we apply that same mentality to our walk with the Lord. That, hey, you know what? I should, I should be, I've been a Christian for a while. I should be able to go tell somebody Jesus loves them. I should be able to ask them, can I pray with you right now? And we start feeling it weigh on us, and we're like, oh, I need to pray. And then we're just like, I'll pray for you, and we walk away. Instead of, let's pray right now. And then we, we walk away, and we're like, oh, I missed it. Oh, I should have prayed right then. And Paul's saying, listen, if we can just have, a, if we can just have a, an agreement that if God puts it in front of us to do, we do it. Then we don't have to have judgment after the fact. I don't have to judge myself. I did it. And even then, sometimes it's hard. I mean, you can, you can ask my wife. There are times that I walk off the stage and I say, worst sermon I've preached in a 10-year span. But God didn't ask me to preach the best sermon ever, every single Sunday. He said, share my word. Well, I did that. Well, I don't have to judge myself. And any time I do, whenever I walk, and this is, this is true, you can, you can fact check this. She's sitting right there. Anytime I walk off the stage and say, we're sermon in a 10-year span, that's, I, don't, I can't believe people didn't get up and walk out. It was that bad. What happens is all through the week, people call me and text me. Man, when you said this, wow, that got me thinking. Because of God's faithfulness, right? Sometimes they say, you say this. And I'm like, I didn't say that, but God's really good and gracious, and that's what you heard, and so I love that. <laughs> like when we just are faithful, right? I mean, this is, this is what judging ourselves does. It says that God is completely dependent on our awesomeness. And if I didn't do it awesome, God's probably not big enough to take what I did and use it. How limiting of an opinion of God is that? Our awesomeness is still not awesome compared to his awesomeness. And part of his awesomeness is that he takes our actions, feeble and weak as they are, and turns them into something great. This is why the Bible can say things like, it's in my weakness that his strength is made perfect. It's where we see his strength, is that when I come weak, weak and feeble, that God takes my effort and he turns it into something through his goodness. And Paul's saying, this is the faith that we have. This is the grace that he's given us, that if we just do what he put in front of us to do, we don't have to be judged by anyone. We don't care if they judge us. We don't have to judge ourselves. Hey, I did what God asked me to do. And we can walk away knowing that I did what I was supposed to do. And then the result of that, that's on God anyway. It's not on me.
And then to, to make sure that he doesn't come off as prideful or unapproachable, right? To make sure that he's not there going, man, I've got that. I got this a long time ago. I taught you guys this when I was there. Like, why aren't you guys doing this? Why all the judgment? Judgy, judgy. Like, to make sure that that's not how he comes across, he continues in verse 5. I'm sorry, in verse 4, when he says, I don't even, I don't even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. He's like, sure, I mess up. I'm not innocent. Sure, I've done things I shouldn't have done. Sure, I've said things I shouldn't have said. But my conscience is clear because I was just doing what I thought. My conscience is clear because I can trust in the gospel. I mean, the gospel is that God forgives us. That's the gospel. And he forgives us. Like, when he died, as you're looking at a timeline, when he died, all of your sins were future. And for us, sometimes we get stuck in this mentality of, oh, sure, God has forgiven everything that I have done. No, he's forgiven everything that you will do. And so as you're working for him, as you're trying to do the best for his kingdom, and you make mistakes, there's grace for that. And hindsight's always 2020. so if you replay that event in your mind, you're like, should have said that. Man, that would have been good. Hey, use that for next time. Just put that right there in your back pocket. I was going to quote Seinfeld, but I won't. I'll move on. Verse 5, therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring light to what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. Now that sounds terrifying. But listen to his very next statement. At that time, at that time when whatever is hidden in darkness is brought to light and whatever motives of our heart are exposed at that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now listen, when we come together as a church, we praise him. And here this Bible verse is saying that at that time, he's going to praise you. How humbling will that be for us? We're the God of creation who spoke everything into perfection. Let there be light, and there was light. Now, by comparison, we're going to be standing in front of that God, and he's going to say, hey, man, when they drop that stuff and you help pick that stuff up for them, man, good job, you? And we're going to be like, yeah, when you said let there be light and there was light, good job, you. Like, what do you say in response to that, right? I want us to feel the awkwardness of this, that we're going to be in front of the God of creation, and he's going to be praising us for the things that we did. This is what the Bible is telling us. And how do we get that praise? What is the praise that comes? Well, the praise that comes is from us doing the things that he's just put in front of us to do. And this is the praise that we all crave. That praise... Praise is, is this. Well done. Good and faithful servant. When you stand in front of the throne of God and he says, well done, you were a good and faithful servant. That's the praise that we all crave. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close in prayer here. It's, um, it's Mother's Day. I know you guys have some things planned. And I'm going to ask you if you'd stand if you would.
James um, wrote a book in the Bible at the time that this was written in Corinthians, James had become sort of the, the lead pastor of the primary church in Jerusalem. Um, he was the, the, the lead guy there. Um, Peter, who had started that church there in Jerusalem, had kind of taken a apostolic role over all the Jewish ministries. And so he was working with all the guys that were being sent out as missionaries uh, to all the different Jewish people that were scattered throughout the world. And James was pastoring the church James happened to be the brother of Jesus. And James talks a lot about our works. And um, one of the things that he says is, you, you prove to me that you're saved by your faith. I'll prove to you that I'm saved by my works. Now, he didn't say, when he says that, he's, what he's not meaning is, I'm saved by my works. He's saying that my works are the evidence of my salvation. That because I'm saved, I'm willing to do whatever he wants me to do. That because I'm saved, I'm willing to live the way that he wants me to live. That because I'm saved, I'm willing to obey, to humbly submit to his plans. That because I'm saved, I will work. And this is the commitment that we should all have to him. This is the difference. This mentality that he's trying to get, Paul's trying to get the church in Corinth to have. This mentality is the difference from Jesus being your Savior and Jesus being your Lord. If he's just your Savior, you're just going to keep asking to be saved. But when you make him Lord, you start asking, what can I do for you? And this is the heart that Paul wants us to have as we look to our Lord and say, what can we do for you? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your kindness. God, that you would partner with us and allow us to have any part to play in the expansion of your kingdom and bringing glory to your name. God, it's a humbling thing. So God, I pray that by your grace, that you would continue to help us to recognize the opportunities that we have that you've given us to do the things that you ask us to do. God, to live in a way that you want us to live, to, to talk in a way that you want us to talk, to make decisions in a way that you want us to make decisions. God, to interact with people the way that you want us to interact. God, I just pray that you would help us to be able to do the things that you want us to do. You've prepared these things in advance for us to do. You've prepared us to do them. You've equipped us. You've given us the knowledge. You've given us the ability. You've given us the opportunity. God, I pray that we would take advantage of those things, not because we just want to be well-known, not because we're building up our own resume as a Christian, not, not any of that. God, out of humble and glad submission to you, and the things that you desire for us. God, help us to live in such a way that we, when we're standing in front of your throne, will hear you speak the phrase, well done, good and faithful servant. Now God, we can't live that life on our own. We're justified by faith. We need your grace. We need your strength. But God, we're judged by works. Help us. Help us to do the things that you want us to do. We ask that in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.